this is not as exciting as sales and marketing stuff. I get excited about sales and marketing content. This isn't so much, but it's going to deal with some things that will help you run your business more effectively and help you know yourself better. Uh, you know, when we, we start taking a look at some of the great sages of, of all time, we look at people, uh, you know, I, I've seen it attributed to no less than six ancient sages that we should know thyself, from Aristides to Socrates to Plato, a host of others. How many of you feel like you still have things to learn about yourself? Just show of hands real quick, okay. Well, I think every hand in the room went up, so would it be a fair assumption then to say that maybe we don't always know as much about our team as we should know? We've all had the experience, if you've ever hired anybody, if you've ever had anybody as a part of your team that is, you, you know, you interviewed them, you, uh, you, went, you, you vetted them very thoroughly. And there's really three things that you need to know when you hire people. We'll talk about these a little bit more in detail, but those things are you have to, number one, can they do the job? You've got to answer that question. Do they have the skills and the education and the experience, the training to do the job? Can they do the job? Secondly, are they willing to do the job? Are they motivated? They have belief systems and, and, and value systems that are, uh, that are congruent with yours as an organization with you personally. Are they willing to do the job? Are they motivated? Because the fact of the matter is, I don't care how smart somebody is, if they don't want to do the job, if they're not motivated to do the job, it's not gonna happen. And then the third question we have to ask is where they fit in. Are they going to fit into our organization? We've all had cases, we've all had situations where we had people on our teams that were plenty smart enough. Education, training, experience, there was no question that they had what they needed to be successful in our business. But they didn't make it because they weren't motivated. Now we also have situations where we get people that are, they, their value systems are congruent with ours. Their, their beliefs, their motivations are exactly what we need to have in our business, but they don't know how to do what they need to know how to do. So they're motivated, but they may be a motivated idiot. You know, I mean, it's, that's just kind of the way it works. But you have to have all three. And we've also had the situation where you had somebody who was plenty smart enough, they were motivated enough, and for whatever reason, you were just like this. How many of you have ever had that happen? Where you, you honestly, you know, they were smart enough and they were motivated, but for some reason, every time the two of you talked, you clashed. Okay. Well, Jim, that's pretty much you and everybody. But, 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 but the fact is, is we, ha we have to say, okay, why is that happening and how, how do we assess to make sure we have the right person in the right role? How do we assess to make sure that we're communicating with people properly? And frankly, we've all had situations as well. All of us have had this as well. How many of you have recruited people in your businesses over the years? And I'll tell you what, we're going to ditch the mic. Is that okay if we do that? This one's breaking up. We'll fix that before the next session. We've also had people that have been good salespeople, maybe even great salespeople with other organizations. And they came over to us and for whatever reason, it didn't work. We tried to show them our system. We tried to show them the way they, that we do things. It didn't happen. It just didn't happen. You know, we thought we've, we've given them the training, their, their experience, they've been successful. Why can't they do it like I do it, Rock. Why can't they do it like I do it? We're going to talk about some things today that are part of what we call Colby wisdom. Let me give you a little background on that. There's a lady named Kathy Colby who has built this co corporation around this assessment that is called a Colby A. And to tell you a little bit of her background, she's, and I love the lady dearly, but she's severely ADD. Uh, she is dyslexic, 
And to top it all off, she had an extremely serious car accident a few years ago and had a little brain damage as a result of it. So, you know, we, we, she and I will talk to each other and we love each other, but sometimes there's just a disconnect there. But she's brilliant because she, she knew that there was something else out there and she started studying a science that had literally never really been studied that much and building algorithms around that science and how do we assess to help people be more effective in organizations. Now, it's funny how things fall, fall in a pattern. And this organization is a family business. Is that a fair statement? Okay. I was in St. Louis in Kenny's office a couple of weeks ago during the World Series, and I was, selling, I was wearing a St. Louis Cardinal lapel pin. And somebody came up to me and said, I bet you've got one of those lapel pins for every city you travel to. <laughs> and I said, well, I might, but no, not really, because I am a St. Louis Cardinal fan. I told him a story. I told him a story. My father-in-law was named John Edward Culp. And John Ed, with the exception of his God and his family, loved nothing more than Kentucky Wildcat basketball and St. Louis Cardinal baseball. And in Western Kentucky, we were Cardinal fans. And he loved them so much. Now, he, he went back to the day when there was no television coverage of anything. It was strictly radio. And so he had, he had a garage, and he loved to work on things. He fixed lawnmowers. He, did, he was really, really good with his hands. And he would get incredibly frustrated with me because I couldn't change a, a, an air filter on a lawnmower. Okay? If I had ever had to have a job with power tools, I would be missing fingers. And he got so frustrated with that, but I, but I loved him. And he had this radio in his garage, one of the old black radios. It looked like about the size of a loaf of bread. Many of you remember those. And it had two dials, one that you tuned the radio, and the other one was a, a combination on-off switch and volume. Those are the only two controls on the radio. And he had that radio set in the garage to 99.9 .9 WCBL, Benton, Kentucky, because they broadcast two things, Kentucky basketball and St. Louis Cardinal baseball. And he left that radio on all the time because he would go out there and work in the summer, and that was just kind of where he went. And if the Cardinals were playing or Kentucky was playing, he would leave the radio on in the house, so if he had to leave the garage and come into the house, he wouldn't miss anything. He loved Kentucky basketball, and he loved the Cardinals. John Ed died June five years ago, and I miss that man. And as is the case when somebody passes, there are a lot of things that we wind down, a lot of things that we consolidate, a lot of things that have to be done and administered. But we, none of us ever had the, the heart to turn that radio off. And if you go to 1482 Bryantsburg Road in Benton, Kentucky today, you'll be greeted just like you always would be. You'll be welcomed as family. You'll be offered a meal. And if you go around behind that house and you put your ear up to the garage door, you'll hear that radio. This is a family business. Money Concepts is a family business from the international headquarters to region to region to region to region. It's a family business. But sometimes even that isn't enough. Sometimes families, because we expect that they should be able to do it the way we do it, and it doesn't always work that way. That's what Kathy Colby measured. And to, to tell you about her family business, uh, you, you might have heard of a, uh, an assessment called the, the Wonderlick test. The NFL uses it. It's an intelligence test. And it was at the heart of a 1948 Supreme Court case, Duke Power versus the United States government. They used the Wonderlick test as an instrument of discrimination. And that hurt Kathy Colby very badly because Wonderlick was really bad. And so in setting this instrument up, she wanted it to be free of any kind of, of gender bias, any kind of racial bias. She wanted it to be uh, uh, free of any type of cultural bias. This is used in 32 countries now. And it measures something that no other assessment measures. It measures a person's instinctive way of problem solving 
when they have the total freedom to be themselves. See, when we look at a business, uh, when this presentation was originally built, I had two different slides here. I had individual challenges and business challenges. You know what? It was all the same stuff. What are some of the challenges that we face in personally and in our businesses? Self-sabotage. Don't we self-sabotage ourselves at times? And don't we occasionally have employees who sabotage the business? Sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. We, we have, when we talk about inefficiency and ineffectiveness. Now some people don't always have a clear delineation between the two. What's the difference between efficient and effective? Efficiency is when you do things right. Effectiveness is when you do the right things. And sometimes we confuse that because we gravitate towards things that are maybe easier for us to do or the way we've been asked to do them, it's more comfortable. We can be very efficient, but we may not be very effective. We also have problems with stress in businesses. Has, has anybody here ever had maybe a sleepless night in this business? Just, you know, all progress begins with telling the truth, by the way. Uh, we don't always communicate well with our teams. You know, we ask them to do something, they do something entirely different. And there was a lack of communication. Houston, we have a problem. Strain, reduced pro profitability, all of these are, are problems in our businesses. And when we take a look at the hiring challenges, we have to ask ourselves those three questions. Can they do the job? And once again, we've hired people that could do the job. They were socially and culturally interesting people. They had good verbal conversation skills. They had training experience. They were intelligent enough, but for some reason it just didn't work. And sometimes we had people that came in and they're motivated and they're very excited about their role, but once they see how we do it, they get a little less excited. And maybe it's not because our way is wrong, but maybe it's just not their way. And see, when we start looking at that and then we start taking a look at how, what's their instinctive way of problem solving? Will they fit in with our organization or how do we fit together most effectively? When we start answering these three, three questions, we have two things that happen. Number one, actually three. Number one, we start seeing our relationships with our existing team get stronger. Number two, we make better hiring decisions and when we examine ourselves, as Dennis was saying yesterday, there's two instruments that we use, a mirror and a telescope. The first thing we have to do when we're assessing our business, we gotta look in the mirror. It took me until I was in my 50s to realize I was an introvert. But now I do things differently than I used to do and I'm more successful at getting the results that I need to get because I'm doing it my way. And I think that's a journey that ultimately all of us are on. So here's, the, here's some of the challenges that we have from a hiring perspective. I, I got... Get the third one. You didn't get the third one, did you? Uh, so then your team will get stronger. Your team will be stronger. Well, you'll make better hiring decisions, and you'll understand yourself better. Right. Know thyself. Know thyself. When we take a look at, at, at hiring challenges within our industry, there's a designation, there's some people I work with occasionally that have a designation uh, that wraps around HR, and this is an annual survey they do, and they break it into different industries, some fascinating stuff. For example, they, they provided me with a report of the average cost of hiring a sales assistant or hiring a marketing assistant. They got all this data, it's really good stuff. But this relates specifically to the financial services industry. If you hire somebody, if you hire somebody and provide them proper training, the average is in our industry, whatever you're paying them per year, take 50% of that, that's what it costs you to hire them and train them. Now we're talking about staff positions. Financial advisors, it's closer to 100,000 over two years. That's about the number. To really get somebody trained up properly. That's the kind of money you can spend because most firms do it ineffectively. But just for our teams, we're talking about 50% of their annual salary. That's what we're looking at in hiring costs. Secondly, annual training costs around $1,000 a year. 
I'm going to suggest strongly that for those of us that have local offices, we don't provide enough training to our people. We bring them in, we onboard them, and then God bless you. You're on your own. Not everyone, but I'm going to suggest that there's a lot of that. We don't provide enough training. But if we do, it's expensive. How many of you had people go to the, uh, the sales marketing assistant workshop down in Florida? You know, look around. What, does, is there any cost involved with that? Was there any cost to you? Was there any cost to the company, Dennis? I, absolutely. It's not inexpensive to train people. So it's expensive to hire them, and it's expensive to do initial training, and it's expensive to provide ongoing training. 85% of the, the training that your people get, though, is on site. And we still spend a lot of money. And in spite of our best efforts, we have some, I see some people in here that provide an exceptional training experience. Not excellent, not good, exceptional. And we hire people that are really smart people, that are motivated people, and it just doesn't work out because somehow we, we can't figure out how to fit them into our system. They just don't fit. Has anybody had that experience? Okay, if that's the case, this is, not, it, 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 <laughs> this is not a total answer to all your problems, but it might be a partial answer to some of those problems. It's called Colby. There's three different parts to the mind. Traditionally, we assess the first two. The cognitive piece is training, experience, education. How do we measure those things when we're in a hiring situation? Well, often, if you're hiring somebody, what's the first thing that you look at? Pardon? How they present themselves, but before they come in, what do we often look at? Resume. Resume tells us about what? Their training, experience, and education. And all of that can be validated. Now, we're kind of at a point in time where, for example, um, calling for job references is a total and abject waste of time. Because what you do is you call somebody up and say, hey, listen, I need a reference on so-and-so. When did they say they worked here? Such and such a date, such and such a date. That's correct. Thank you for calling. That's all you'll get out of them. Is that right? So, for, so for example, but, but we can validate that. We can check out, did they actually get this degree? Have they had this training? Did they work at this place a certain amount of time? That's not that tough. And we can usually get a feel using different aptitude tests, whether you use something like Wonderlick, or, and there's a thousand of them out there. We can have them type something to see if they can actually keyboard. Let's say you're hiring a data entry assistant. For example, Kenny has people on his team, they do nothing but data entry, right? So you can test for that. You know, Brenda can figure out, do, can they in fact do data entry? You can assess for that. We can give intelligence tests, we can do all that stuff. That's pretty easy to figure out. The second piece is what the, the psychologists call affective. As opposed to the cognitive, which is training, experience, education, Affective is feelings, it's beliefs, it's preferences, it's uh, foundational belief systems. Those things we can measure very effectively using, using tools such as DISC, such as Myers-Briggs. Those tools are all very helpful, by the way. Those, they're, they're all very helpful. DISC will measure a lot of things that revolve around preference, or a lot around style, which, by the way, changes with time. See, the first two, cognitive, the cognitive piece changes with time. We know more today than we did a year ago, I hope. <laughs> Don't we, you know, our experience level grows. You, you know, experience, you can't teach experience. So somebody comes in, they have a baseline of education. And then we provide training. And they get experience. They have to deal with nasty clients. They have to deal with breakdowns in sales administration. They get experience. That's, that's invaluable. You can't teach experience. But that changes with time. See, if we do an aptitude test, if we do an IQ test, an intelligence test, that doesn't, that's not predictive. It's never predictive. It just tells us how smart somebody is today. 
It's good to know, but it's not predictive. The affective assessments, such as Myers-Briggs and DISC, that changes with time. Your preferences, your values, your belief systems change with time. Now, I, I will get questioned on that one occasionally. Because people say, well, my values haven't changed. And I usually have a kind of a technical response to that. It's something like, shut up. <laughs> Don't tell me your values are the same now as when you were 18. <laughs> you know, just... Don't, yeah, don't even try. You know, we were very different people. We were very different people. And, I, you know, we, we talk, we've been talking a lot about social media. I want you to understand something. I get up every day, and I thank God that I didn't have Facebook when I was 20. Because I'd been world-class stupid. Okay? So our values change. Our belief systems change. And while we can measure those things and it's good to know, it's not predictive. It's not predictive. But then there's this thing called conation. Conation is one of the hundred most obscure words in the English language according to uh, Oxford. I had never heard of it before I took a Colby assessment. And what conation is, is it's been proven that people have an instinctive way of problem solving when they have the total freedom to be themselves and it never changes. It never changes. The way you initiate problem solving today is the same way that you initiate problem solving when you were a child. And that's what Colby measures. Now, how did I get to this point where I know this stuff? I took a Colby A about 10 years ago, part of an entrepreneur coaching program, and I, I thought there's some real genius here. I mean, I. It showed me some things that, that I, I, I felt like intuitively I knew, but now it confirmed them. And when I followed what they said was my MMO or my modus operandi, when I did it the way they said was the most instinctive way, I found I got better results. I got better results. And so I asked the people that gave me the instrument, you know, to tell me more. I want to know more about this, and they couldn't. So I contacted Colby, and what I learned has had a... Uh, it's changed my life in a lot of ways. It's definitely changed my business. And I thought, this is something my clients need, and I got certified in the technology. And like all certifications, I have to go out to Tempe a couple times a year. I'm on webinars, and they made me read a book. And for those of you that don't know me real well, I don't play well with others. I don't respond well to people saying, I have to do this or I have to do that. It's just not me. And so I resented having to read this book, life-changing book. It's called Quiet. Quiet, and it's subtitled, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. And so we have to go through a, a, about, I don't know how many hours it is a year, of continuing education to maintain our certification, but we're constantly learning about new tools that Colby Corporation has to offer. That's how I have come to this place. Now, what does this mean to you? Conation, once again. It's an action that's derived from instinct. And we talk about the human condition. We talk about human beings. We don't like to think of ourselves as, high, as instinctive creatures. We like to think of ourselves as somewhat higher than that. But if you go back to Psychology 101, you study Maslow's pyramid of the, of, of the hierarchy of human needs, we're very instinctive. We are very instinctive. And so this whole thing of conation is... It's not about how you recreate. It's not about what you do just for funsies. It's when you are striving. We call them striving instincts. When you're trying to attain an objective, when you're working in a purposeful manner, you have an instinctive way of problem solving, and you've always done it that way. And when you were stifled, you were not nearly as effective. They've been doing some brain, brain research at Colby the last few years. I volunteered, was not accepted. Might have been a reason. Don't, yeah. Tom says hairstyle. Well, I, you know, I confess I'm guilty. Poor haircut. Um, but what they found is, is that they would assess these people and they could identify how they initiate problem solving. And they would put them into situations and have them do it totally contrary to their instincts. 
and, as, and they had them hooked up to EEG machines, and when they studied their brain waves, they found out that 75% of their brain lit up like a light bulb. But when after periods of rest, they were allowed to do it in a way that was totally, 100% within their MO, they lit up 10% of their brain. They've been able to determine it takes seven and a half times more mental energy to go against your grain than it is, does to go with it. All of us have had days, you know, by the way, let's, let's be real clear about something here. H have any of you seen, ever seen a show called Deadliest Catch? The Bering Sea fishermen, they're out there in 20 degree below weather, in, in 30 foot seas, they're working 30 hour shifts, on a boat that's pitching 30 degrees. How many of you remember the cruise to a Grand Bahamas that one year? <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> we all remember that cruise. In, in fact, there were, myself and one other person ended up at the dinner table of eight, because the rest of them couldn't do it anymore. And we're saying, hey, pass me the chicken parmigiana. When you walked out on the deck, it looked like a Jim Jones grape juice party. I mean, there were people laying all over the deck, they were as white as Ben's shirt, and their eyes were open, and their mouths were open. It was just <laughs> horrible. That's this deadliest catch. That's what these people do all the time. So listen, 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 listen. When you feel like you're having a tough day, remember, you don't have a real job. That's a real job. But you know what? We do. We come home some days from work, and we're exhausted. And it may have been pushing around pencils and talking to people on the phone. I mean, how does that happen? And the result is usually, it's usually a result of going against our grain, not doing it in a way that's best for us. So this whole thing of conation, a conscious effort to carry out self-determined acts, you're striving, you're being purposeful, you're going after your goals there. But if, and when you do it your way, you're, 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 most, you're your best self. We're our most successful. So what's Colby Wisdom? They have taken this, and over 35 years they've done over a million of these assessments. They've continually refined the algorithm where you take an online assessment, they ask you questions, and they say, when you have the total freedom to be yourself, Tom, here's four different things. Which one's most important? Which one's least important? Here's, here's some interesting things about Colby Wisdom. Only 3.4% of the people that are ever retested, even after years, ever change. I have one client who had taken it twice, and he said, I want to take it a third time, because I'm going to try and job the test. And he's that kind of guy. And I said, well, no, I'm not going to let you do that, because I have to pay for those, those tests. He said, well, I'll pay the cost of it. I said, knock yourself out. It still didn't change. This is the way we were born. This is the way we were born. And when my father-in-law got incredibly frustrated, and I did, I loved the man, but he would get so angry at me because I couldn't fix stuff. I just can't. <laughs> but by the same token, if he had to get up in front of church and speak to somebody, he might not be able to do that either. See, we all have our gifts. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the beauty of that. There's more than one way to be a financial advisor. We'll talk about that. In addition to that, if we can assess administrative candidates for specific instinctive ways of problem solving and get them to line up with us, do you think we have a better chance of being successful? So, when you take a look at all the press on Colby, it's amazing, I'm gonna skip over that. But I will tell you this, I had, um, I had an opportunity to have lunch and spend uh, half a day with General William Scott Wallace, four-star general, uh, retired, United States Army. Uh, how many of you heard of the, fra the fratricide of Pat Tillman, uh, NFL star who was killed in a friendly fire incident? Uh, general Wallace was the one who was assigned to adjudicate the people that were responsible for that. And he and I were talking, and I said, and because that never came up, and he, the, he had made a presentation, I was making a presentation, we got a chance to have lunch together. That never came up in his presentation. I said, that must have been extremely hard to go through that. He goes, not really. 
It was a question of right and wrong. And I've got a process for determining those things. He did it his way. And the one thing I liked about the guy, that they always told me I would never become a general. When I was a, I was a colonel, I'd never become a general unless I did tour duty and walk. And I said, I'm not going there. That place is full of crazy people. And he ended up retiring as a four star. Never did a tour of, tour of duty at the Pentagon. But he used this for all of his senior command staff to get people in the right places. And in his exemplary military career, he had a, an extremely high track record of success because he hired people that knew how to do the job, that wanted to do the job or were willing to do the job, and could fit in with his team. So, when we start taking a look at Colby, the, we, what we do is we measure four different things that we call action modes. What they have been able to prove through, in the research over the last 35 years is there's only four ways that people initiate problem solving. Number one is by how we gather and share information. It's called fact finder. Some people are detail people. Some people are extreme detail people. Uh, now, there's two people at this back table I'm going to call out. I didn't get permission, but I don't care. Uh, Rock Trinnell is as 30,000 foot a person as you'll ever know. He, he can take a look at a situation and he can get the big vision. He can see the big picture and then he can inspire, inspire others to take action. But don't ever ask Rock to research anything. It will be a flaming disaster. He's not a researcher, but he gets the big picture. On the other hand, Becky Mueller, Becky has an assistant who probably is not a better assistant in the money concept system named Marilyn Burris. But God help her, if you ask her what time it is, she's going to tell you how to build a clock. She is intensive with her ability and her need to gather a lot of detail. And if Marilyn tells you something, if she says, here's the way it is, you can bank on it. Because she's done the research. She knows the homework. You know, me, if you ask me something that has to do with the, I go, sure, we can make that work. Well, maybe not. But if Marilyn says this is how it works, that's how it works. And so Becky's got her in a position where she's allowed to utilize her gift. And so fact finder, you, you can go all the way from being a 30,000 foot person who just gets the big picture to somebody who needs meticulous detail. For example, I've got a client in Minneapolis. He's a, a, a CFA. Uh, it's a, there's a financial advisor who does qualified plans. He does about a million and a half in, in revenue a year. He has a team of two. He has the CFA, and then he has a relationship manager. Well, a CFA, chartered financial analyst, my first thought was, this guy's going to be so detail-oriented, he's going to be a researcher. Not even close. But what he does is he can take a look at other people's research and tell whether or not it's valid, and he's great at combining it. He's used his gift in an appropriate fashion, but if you sent this guy to a, a mutual fund company and said, we're going to make you an analyst, he would fail, be an abject failure. But he builds good systems, which kind of leads us to the next one, which is called follow-through. That's how people systematize and arrange. For example, some people are very systematic. There are some people, and, and I'm sure some of you may be this way and you may have assistance this way, that if something is out of alphabetical order, they go ballistic. They freak out. And you'll have other people that you will go into their offices and they have a disease that I call the piles. They might have four piles of stuff on their desk, but they always seem to know exactly where something is. And those are people that shortcut well. And while we, we do want to have an office that's professional and has a professional decorum about it, sometimes we have to let people do it their way without going to extremes. The third one, this, this one that we call green, is called quick start. It's how people deal with risk and uncertainty. We know people that can improvise well. Uh, we know people that can shoot from the hip. We know people that, that are, are future thinking. We have other people that if they have a, 
Let, let's say they have a, a certain routine that they go through every day. If they change, if you change their routine, they just go nuts. Okay. If if you start saying, well, I'll tell you what, we're thinking about opening the office. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna open instead of at eight o'clock every morning. We're gonna be open at eight o'clock on Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday we're gonna be open eight thirty. Thursday uh, nine o'clock, and we're not gonna open on Friday. They they can't deal with it. Because especially if you're changing it all the time, you got people that if you try and put them on flex time, they never take advantage of it. They're status quo people. But other people, you know, hey, sure, we'll do something new. They'll try something new. They'll experiment. That's how they deal with risk and uncertainty. The people that have a low index, for example, in Quick Start, you can depend on them to bring order out of chaos. Does anybody here besides me like to create a little chaos? Uh, ask around our office. I, I'm the king of chaos. But by the same token, we have an assistant who makes some order out of my chaos and Jim's chaos. And both of us drive Becky nuts. Fair statement? Fair statement, okay. And then we have implementer. Now implementers, for example, when they assess uh, surgeons, dentists, they have a high implementer score. What implementer means is you, you create solutions with your hands. We're not a hands-on business. We're not building stuff. But if I have a surgeon, I want somebody who's really good with their hands. Okay, we will see people that have medical degrees in surgery, they have low implementers, you know what they usually end up doing? Teaching at medical school. They aren't the cutters. Now what is, is interesting about these four action modes is you get a high, you know, you can have a score from one to 10 in any one action mode. And only 5% of the population will have what we call an MO when we combine the four, the, the four numbers, only 5% of the population will have an MO similar to yours. In other words, we've got lots of different groups of people out there that do things lots of different ways. And if we don't identify that, we can't take care of their very best, we can't take advantage of their very best talents. Now, for example, if you take a look at a Colby index, it's not just any one score that's important. It's all four of them in combination, number one, and number two, the low numbers are equally as valuable as the high numbers. So for example, I'm a 6482. I'm creative. I sort things by color. High, high quick starts will have a tendency to sort things by color. High fact finders will use alphabetical order or numbered systems. Almost all librarians. Very high fact finder, very high fact finder. And see, these things are predictive. We can tell how they will do in certain roles. But my two in implementer is equally as valuable as my eight in quick start. Now, why is that? Because, see, in our culture, we've all been taught that high scores are best, right? That's how we keep score, except in golf, right, Tom? <laughs> except in golf. But high scores are best. That's not true with Colby. Because what my two in implementer means is that when I start creating solutions, I don't build models and I don't use props and demo things. It's done up here. I can see the solution before we put it on paper. I can see the solution before it's created. And coupled with my eight and quick start, which gives me a propensity to look into the future, I have people say, you know, it's amazing, how uncanny how, how I've been right about certain things. But with my common, with my MO, that's, that's my gift. But I can't fix the lawnmower. <laughs> so we have to go within our gifts. When you take a look at this, for example, if, if you look at a Colby A result, it, it's a 13 page report. It gives you information how you initiate problem solving. It tells your best communication methodologies. See, I communicate, not surprisingly, my instinctive way of communicating is with spoken word. I'm a pretty good writer, but I don't do it with charts and graphs because my, my fact finder, I've never been a person that uses lots of charts and graphs. I use pictures. Uh, for those of you that were in my session this morning, um, what did you see a lot of in my session this morning? Pictures. I had a picture of an ocean. I had a picture of, of a prairie. Because a picture does become worth a thousand words. 
but that's not the way for everybody to communicate. And so, for example, in presentations, I try and be aware of that. I use combinations of charts and graphs and data and pictures because my audience is going to have a combination of all three. And this can benefit you as an advisor because we've all had clients. We always talk about, oh, I got this client who's an engineer. <laughs> okay, we've all had that, which is not a problem if you're an engineer. But you figure out, here's how you sell to engineers. There's a way to do it. There are, are, there's a process and steps that you can use to sell to engineers. Because engineers have to buy financial planning, so what's the best way to sell to them? Understanding this about yourself makes you much more aware of it than other people. And when we start taking a look at these action modes, once again, the two in implementer means that I prevent problems when it comes to tangible solutions. I don't create solu tangible solutions. I use them to prevent problems. And so understanding all this about yourself says, okay, I'm going to be an advisor. Here's the best way for me to advise. And secondly, because it does make me aware, I start asking prospects questions like this. Hey, when you're making a really big decision, let's say you're going to buy a car. Are you the person that does a lot of research online? Are you the kind of person that's just bought the same brand and you just want to go drive, you want to smell it, you want to feel how it rides? How do you buy a car? They can tell me that and I have a much better feel for how they're going to buy my products and services. It makes you aware of this and other people, that not everybody makes decisions the same way that you do. What are the business applications of this? Well, first of all, when we, when we have teams, and Rock, since you're here today, I, I'm, may, I, may I tell a little bit about our interaction with Stan? Please. Rock is a 30,000 foot person. He's a three fact finder. This guy can create, and, and what's your, what's your uh, quick start, your high quick start? 10 quick start, he's a visionary, but he's a big picture guy, okay? Stan is a nine fact finder, he's an accountant. Seeing the two of them communicate is, shall we say, amusing. <laughs> okay, I mean, it really is. And when I would hear the two of them talk behind each other's backs about what it was like to work with the other one, chaos is a good way to describe it. There was, shall we say, a lack of communication at times. You know, Rock would want to know what time it is, and Stan would tell him how to build a clock. I mean, that's just the way it is. So we had a, we had a workshop, and I had never met Stan before. And I was given his report, and we sat here, and I started telling Stan things about himself. But, and he kept nodding yes, and he kept nodding yes more and more. And his head was moving more and more, but here's the thing that got him. I said, Stan, you're probably the kind of guy that lays your clothes out every night before you go to bed. And his jaw dropped. Now this isn't a parlor trick. This is a way, if we understand ourselves better, and if Rock and Stan understand one another better, how's your communication going now compared to the way it was? It's, you know, and it's always a work in progress. It's always a work in progress. The other thing that it does is it makes you mindful. For example, Kimberly, our regional assistant, is an extremely bright and talented woman, but she's not one of these you just drop a bomb on. And so I dropped a bomb on her the other day. I said, oh, let me back up a little bit. Here's what I'd like you to look at. Look at A, B, and C, and then tell me what you think is best, and let's talk about it Monday, because it wasn't urgent. I, I'm, you know, with, I'm one of those people, everything's urgent. Well, her not so much. She wants to think about it. And so the business application is I know myself better, employees know themselves better, and we know how to better interact. We understand how we work and where we fit in the team dynamic. Also, we've seen people in different positions, we've seen people at firms that were so totally horribly out of position, we move them to a new role, and all of a sudden they shine. And it's usually because we're taking advantage of their MO in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And good people can be coached to accommodate others' MOs. So, you know, Rock understands, he's, I was getting ready to say he's a little more patient with Stan, and I'm not sure I'm quite ready to go there. Okay, well, let's see, that's, that's a great outcome, Rock. He's more patient with, yeah, he's more patient with, with Stan from the stand. He knows that Stan needs to give him that detail. And we're not going to let Stan go on all day long, but by the same token, Stan understands now he needs to cut to the chase more with Rock. 
in progress. All, it, you know, human relationships, they're a work in progress. They always have been, they always will be. But now since we have a, we have a common language with which we can use to describe this to one another, it becomes tremendously valuable. Um, the other thing that you can do is you make better hiring decisions. Because once again, we've all hired people who were plenty smart enough, they were motivated to do the job, but they just didn't fit in. A friend of mine used to coach football at the University of Minnesota. Pretty good college football coach, pretty good track record. And you know what his hiring method or his recruiting methodology was? Can they play the position? Are they willing to be a part of our team culture? Will they fit in with their teammates? It's the same thing. And as you recruit people, if you're recruiting a sales assistant or marketing assistant, which by the way is a very different role, or if you're hiring an associate accountant, if you're hiring somebody to do data entry, Kenny, uh, Rock, if you're hiring somebody to do PR or social media, doesn't it make sense to find somebody that does things in a way instinctively that that role requires? Now we have a way to assess for it. And that's by using Colby. Now let me talk quickly about the Colby resources. The Colby A is kind of the foundational one. What it does is you take a Colby A and answer the questions from a standpoint, Delbert, what is most and least important to me? Now let's say you're hiring somebody for a particular role. Is anybody hiring here uh, right now for any staff positions? Show of hands, anybody? What are you hiring for, Darren? A bunch of stuff. Did anybody attend? <laughs> I, well, we, we can be bought. Uh, g give me an example of a role that maybe you're, that's kind of a critical need for you. Sales assistant? Someone's a personal assistant. A personal executive assistant to you. So here's what we would do. We would have you take a Colby A, which tells me how you do things, and then you would take a Colby C, which says when I am supervising somebody in this specific role, if we have the role defined clearly, in this specific role, what's going to be most and least important for them to do? and then we assess your candidates and see how they'll fit against that. Because if they don't, good likelihood it's not going to work. What a Colby B does is when, let's say you have, you've had somebody on board for a year, maybe two years, maybe five years. What a, Col, what, the, what a Colby B does is you've taken that A, which says here's how I roll, you've taken the C, which says here's what I need out of that position, the person who's the employee takes a Colby B that says, when I'm working for Darren, here's what he feels like is most and least important. And it helps us find out if there's strain, uh, tension, if there's any stress involved or there's miscommunication what the role is. You also have something that we use called a Colby A to A report. They've had this for about two years and it's been a massively impactful uh, report because what it does is it takes two people and it says when these two people are working together, Here's the best way for them to interface. Here's the best way for them to talk to each other, the best way for them to communicate. Should it be email, verbal, what, what combination? Uh, if they're doing a project, who takes what parts of a project? Do they work independently? Do they work collaboratively? It, it gives you a good blueprint for how two people can work together. Sales MO is an interesting report because this gets back to the concept that we've all had people in our organizations that had everything that they needed to be successful, but they couldn't do it our way. They couldn't use our system. And maybe there's two things at play there, in play. Number one, you may have hired somebody that just can't do that system. They may be a great, great salesperson, but they can't do it your way. Or number two, if there's some flexibility in your system, you may be jamming your way of doing it down their throat and insisting they do it your way because you think your way, you know, I've always said I may be wrong, but I'm never in doubt. Okay, that's me. But, but sometimes my way is not somebody else's way. And as long as they're taking care of the client, as long as they're following the basic precepts of your system, do you really care how they illustrate a life insurance policy? Whether they use an illustration or a brochure, do you really care? Does it make a difference as long as the client is well served? 
Let them sell in a way that is most instinctive for them, and they will sell more. Period. Right fit report, uh, this is something we use for larger hiring processes. I've got a, an engagement I'm doing for a, a legal firm in um, Minneapolis right now. They're hiring a, for a new role. And they're, and they're trying to say, okay, who's going to be the best candidate? They're going to be working with this person a certain percentage of time, this person, this person. Who's going to be the best fit? What's the MO we need to hire for? And this goes back to the, to, to the whole, what we call professional hiring matrix. Can they do the job? Are they willing to do the job? Will they fit in? The steps that we want to go through, we want to find out what do they know? What do they know in terms of training, education, experience? When it comes to feelings, are their beliefs and motivations, their preferences congruent with that of the organization? Those first two things, we don't do that with Colby. We do that with interviews. For example, the hiring process that I use, we look at resumes to find out what, can they do the job? At least on paper, can they do the job? And then we verify that, obviously. Then we try and find out, are they willing to do the job? The first thing I want to do is have a 10-minute phone interview. Because frankly, if somebody's lousy on the phone, are they going to be very much benefit to us in our business? I want to find out if they're good on the phone, if they're pleasant, if I feel like I get a connection. If I do, I'll bring them in and interview them. And I could just count on Jim bailing out at this point, but that's exactly how we hired our regional assistant. We went through these resumes, here's the best ones. We talked to a bunch on the phone, we said, here's the best of those, let's bring these three in. And we interviewed three and we thought any of the three can do the job. But we had them do a Colby and use that to make the selection. She fits in perfectly with Jim and I, which, by the way, as Becky will tell you, is no small feat. Can they do the job? Will they do the job? Do they fit in? And what's the process that we use? And right fit helps identify the talents, the job requirements. It takes a look at the total role, the total position, and then helps you rate candidates. Can you use Colby? There's a variety of ways and you can use it. You can use it to assess yourself. Assess the needs that you have within your organization. Uh, you, the, the index is administered through a, uh, it's, it's all, all the Colby indices are administered online. Very easy to implement, pretty easy to interpret. Now there's a couple different ways you can do this. Number one, how many of you believe in the value of professional advice? How many of you believe your clients are better served working through a financial advisor than they are doing it online or doing it themselves. You can do Colby by yourself online. Or you can hire somebody. I provide a pretty substantial discount to Money Concepts, associates and offices, if that's something that you can utilize me for. If you do it online, you're gonna get a good result. I'll you'll get good information. But know that you can contact me if I can help you in any way in this, or if you have any questions on it. If you choose, you know, for example, Rock's office, Eric has been calling me. He's, he's seen additional ways to apply this. We've gone through some training sessions. Eric has a much better understanding of it. I can run the reports, and Eric knows what to do with them. So it's a, there's a progression there as well. Here's the thing that I would tell you. Number one, you've got to know yourself. Colby will help you understand yourself better why you do things the way you do them and the best way for you to do them. It will help you understand your existing team members better. And third, it will help you make better hiring decisions. If one of your multipliers this year is to grow your team, consider using Colby.